But with that, I would like to introduce Neha Narula. She is the director of our very own Digital Currency Initiative. She's been doing lots of very cool research, and uh, today she'll be uh, discussing um, and sharing her thoughts on how to prevent uh, potentially catastrophic cryptocurrency attacks. So let's please give it up for Neha. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for braving the snow and sleet and rain today um, and coming out to hear the second day for the MIT Bitcoin Expo. Did you guys have a good expo? Did it work out? Okay, good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk about preventing catastrophic cryptocurrency attacks. Um, so my name is Neha Narula. Uh, I lead a group here at MIT called the Digital Currency Initiative. Uh, we were founded in 2015, and we are one of the um, first universities to actually create uh, a group dedicated to studying cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. Uh, we consider ourselves educators, obviously. We teach classes. Um, researchers, we write open source code, we publish papers, but also conveners. Um, MIT is, has a history of being a neutral platform, a place where different people can come together. Um, and we try to maintain that. Um, the DCI tries to stay neutral as well. We don't own, um, we don't do ICOs, we don't advise companies, and most of us don't own material amounts of cryptocurrency. So um, I just wanted to point that out. And I think it's important because that means that we can talk about technology and uh, you know, we don't have a financial interest in any particular one. I also wanted to plug uh, something that we're doing um, called the Cryptocurrency Research Review. Uh, you might have seen our newsletter that we've been putting out where we've been soliciting reviews of papers from the community. Um, and we're planning on actually launching a proper conference and journal soon. If you are interested in this topic, if you want to think about peer review and publishing in the space, uh, please check out that link where there's a discourse where you can talk about it. Um, we have a really amazing set of people who signed on to be advisors to this project, including Dan Bonet, Shafi Goldwasser, Arvind Narayanan, Peter Wolf from Bitcoin, Justin Drake from Ethereum, um, and what I'm really excited by is economists from MIT and University of Chicago as well. Um, so I know what you might be thinking, uh, and it might be expressed by this XKCD comic about standards, how whenever you try to create a new standard to fix things, you just end up with a new standard. And maybe that's what's happening with conferences, too. Um, but I think that there really are differences here, and there really are some problems that we want to solve. First of all, we don't have a place that's interdisciplinary, a place where computer scientists, economists, and lawyers can really come together and present their cutting edge research. Uh, we need something a little bit more experimental than the existing venues for peer reviewed research. Uh, this space moves really, really fast. Um, we've been thinking about a lot of different kinds of ideas, including overlay, incentivizing reviewers, uh, making reviews public, and thinking about different ways of taking submissions. Um, but at the same time, we want something that's really rigorous. There are way too many white papers out there that um, just like give you a headache if you try to read them. So we want a place for high quality peer reviewed research. Okay, um, so to get back to the talk, uh, I would say that cryptocurrency is not ready for billions of users. There are obviously a lot of challenges around scalability, interoperability, usability, privacy. However, there's also increasing security risk with new unproven protocols and latent implementation bugs. And that's what I want to talk about here today. Let's think about the current state of cryptocurrency security. There are thousands of cryptocurrencies and code bases. There's really varied levels of security experience. Attackers can easily and anonymously exploit vulnerabilities for financial gain to the point where we consider most cryptocurrencies de facto bug bounties in and of themselves. This is a really challenging space to try to figure out best practices and um, to figure out how to properly deploy fixes. In this talk, I'm going to discuss a few recent vulnerabilities. I'm going to tell you about a vulnerability that I was involved in uh, disclosing. Uh, and then I'm going to go through some lessons learned and some open questions, some things to talk about. So let's get going with recent vulnerabilities. So here are five recent vulnerabilities that were all disclosed over the last two years um, in, uh, in, in sequential order. So the first is CryptoNote. 
Um, the CryptoNote library is used in different coins, um, Monero, Bytecoin, Dashcoin. Uh, and in May 2017, Monero released a disclosure um, about a bug in CryptoNote that would have let an, an attacker uh, arbitrarily create new money. So this was an inflation bug. Um, the next one is about a cryptocurrency called IOTA. Uh, this was in the summer of 2017, um, and I'm gonna go into more detail about that, but this was a signature forgery vulnerability and would allow um, an attacker to steal money. Then there was uh, a pretty big disclosure in Bitcoin Cash. Uh, this would have caused what's called a chain split. An attacker could have broadcast a single transaction, and it, it actually all came down to a single bit even. And this transaction could have caused a chain split in Bitcoin Cash, which would have um, allowed an attacker to potentially double spend on both sides of the chain. Then there was the uh, well-known bug in Bitcoin, which was actually two bugs. Uh, there was a DOS bug, a denial of service bug, and also an inflation bug. And so an attacker could have halted the network or um, created new money. And then more recently, there was uh, a, a subtle flaw in the zero knowledge proof system behind Zcash. And this was really exciting because if this were exploited, this would have caused undetectable inflation. So at least with the other inflations, we would have seen it happening. Um, you know, you would have seen it happening on the chain. With the Zcash flaw, um, you wouldn't have. And these are the, uh, the market caps, according to coin market cap, of these different cryptocurrencies and coins around the time when the, uh, when the bugs were disclosed. So you can see we're dealing with quite a bit of money here. Now, an important note, these bugs were all disclosed to developers. They were not exploited, with one exception. Uh, the developers all deployed mitigations for them, again, with one exception. And uh, to be clear, these vulnerabilities no longer impact the security of the coins mentioned here. So, um, so uh, and, and again, we don't know whether they were exploited. There, some of these vulnerabilities we wouldn't be able to tell, so we can't tell for sure. Uh, we definitely know the Bitcoin bug was exploited. Uh, the attacker created 693 million Bitcoin. Um, and CryptoNote still has this vulnerability in the library. All the coins fixed it, but there's a website called CryptoNoteStarter.org. You can go to it and click a button to create your own coin, and it tells you to fork a repository. This repository has not been updated to, since 2016. So it, uh, considering the fact that the bug was disclosed in 2017, that means that um, it's still vulnerable, which is kind of a bummer. Okay, so I wanna tell you a little bit about um, our experience uh, two summers ago disclosing a bug in a cryptocurrency called IOTA. Uh, so IOTA is a cryptocurrency that's supposed to be for the internet of things. Um, it, uh, at the time of our disclosure, it had roughly a $1.2 billion market cap. Um, and IOTA is a bit different than other cryptocurrencies. It uses something called a directed acyclic graph instead of, uh, or a tangle, that's what they call it, instead of a linear chain of blocks. Um, IOTA has partnerships with several large companies. So Bosch has purchased a significant amount of IOTA tokens, in their own words. And Volkswagen has said that they are releasing an IOTA-related product in 2019. Uh, importantly for our attack, uh, the IOTA developers wrote their own hash function that they call curl. So a little bit of background and terminology. Um, so if you're familiar with Bitcoin, payments are usually called transactions. In IOTA, they're called bundles. Transactions are actually something else. Uh, the unit of currency is an MIOTA, and um, that's about 28 cents right now. Uh, but most importantly, while Bitcoin and every other cryptocurrency uses binary representation, bits and bytes. Uh, IOTA uses trinary representation, so trits and trites. Um, so a trite is three trits. Now you might be wondering why did we look at this cryptocurrency? Um, at the time that we looked at it, it was a top 10 cryptocurrency, but there actually is a story behind it. It's a little bit random. Um, so on the left is one of my colleagues. His name is Michael Casey. Um, He's an advisor to the Digital Currency Initiative, written some books on the topic, likes to talk about um, this area. Uh, and he came into the office one day and he was really excited. Um, he said, there's this new cryptocurrency that solves all the problems, it's scalable, it doesn't have any fees, it's decentralized. Um, the person in the middle there is Taj Dreija, also at the DCI, um, and Taj just immediately replied, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, the thing is, Taj says no to everything. And so I was kind of sick of it. And so I said, Taj, you have to stop saying everything sucks. You actually have to have a reason behind it, OK? You can't say it sucks unless you have a reason. And so he said, fine. And so he started looking at the IOTA code. And he noticed that they had written their own hash function. And he thought it looked a little bit fishy. And so he called in. Um, one of our friends and collaborators, Ethan Heilman, who at the time was at Boston University. Um, Ethan really likes breaking hash functions. Um, and so Taj talked to him about it. And Ethan proceeded to spend the next weekend breaking curl, sort of coming up with a way of breaking curl. Literally, he skipped a party to do this. Um, so so it, was, it was kind of random, to be quite honest. Um, it was a confluence of events um, that we just kind of took uh, took to its conclusion. Um, but I think it was pretty illustrative. Um, so let me explain what our attack was. Um, and the people listed on the bottom here are all of the co-authors on the paper that we eventually wrote describing how we did this attack. So you've got Bob and Eve. And Bob and Eve have funds under joint control, and they want to spend those funds. So Bob signs a payment where he thinks he's getting $2 million, and Eve gets almost nothing. But Eve is able to forge Bob's signature and instead sends a payment where she gets $2 million and Bob gets almost nothing. This is what's known as the chosen message setting. Eve gets to create the message that Bob signs, so she gets to create um, the payment. So to understand um, how our attack operates, I need to explain what multisig is. I think a lot of you probably know, but for those who don't, Multisig is kind of analogous to the two-person rule in nuclear launch, where you need two keys in order to, to launch the nuclear weapon. One is not enough. Um, you can use two of two multisig for payments. Uh, the general version of multisig is that it requires K of N signatures. So here's a two of two. So someone has locked up money in a multisig address, and they want to spend from it. They have to produce a transaction that has both of the signatures on it in order to move those coins. So why multisig? Well, it's added security. An attacker has to compromise both keys in order to take the money. Uh, and oftentimes, you can actually store the different keys in different locations. Um, for example, you could put one in cold storage so it's really safe and not connected to the internet. And this is actually a technique that's used by many exchanges. So multisig is definitely a thing. Uh, also, to, in order to understand a little bit about our, our attack, I have to tell you about IOTA's signature scheme. So IOTA uses a signature scheme called Winternet's One-Time Signatures, or WATS. Uh, however, IOTA modifies this signature scheme in a very particular way. They hash messages with the hash function curlp27 before they apply the signature scheme. So here's sort of uh, like some pseudocode for what the signature function, the sign function looks like. Um, and note here what's happening is that the message is hashed before it's signed. So in a way, we don't really even, I don't even need to tell you about watts and how it works because um, if you can break the hash function, you can forge signatures in IOTA. And so let me show you how this happens, what this looks like. Um, so there's four steps. I'm going to show how an attacker Eve can, um, can use creating colliding bundles in order to do unauthorized payments. So um, first off, Eve creates two very special looking payments um, or bundles, and they have the same hash. In one of them, she gets paid, and in the other one, Bob gets paid. Um, importantly, same hash. So she gives a bundle that pays Bob to Bob, Bob takes a look at it, looks legit. Bob puts his signature on it, and then sends it back to Eve. Eve then copies Bob's signature from the benign bundle that pays him to the evil bundle that pays her. Because they have the same hash, the signature works on the evil bundle as well. And then she broadcasts what is now a valid payment. She signs the bundle as well, and she broadcasts what is now um, a valid payment, the evil bundle. And to be clear, Bob never saw or authorized this payment. Um, so that's the general outline of the attack. Uh, but how do we go about creating two different bundles that have the same hash? Hash functions are supposed to be, um, are supposed to be you know, protect against that. They're supposed to be collision resistant. Um, so we place collisions inside of the bundles in very special ways. 
So here, is, um, here are the value fields inside a single bundle. So this bundle is paying four people. Uh, Eve's getting one M iota, and Bob is getting a whole bunch of them. And here is the ternary representation of that value field. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use our, um, our, uh, our ability to break curl P27 to place collisions very carefully inside um, the, to, to, to place differing trits very carefully inside this bundle such that um, a copy of it with different trits still has the same hash. So um, we're going to target what is here, the 26 trit. So it's pretty um, high up in the value field. And we're going to um, swap a 0 with a 1 and um, uh, a 1 with a 0. And then what this does is it effectively creates another bundle in which Eve is getting a ton of, of money and Bob is getting barely anything. Um, the blue one is the bundle that Bob sees. The red one is the bundle that Eve actually ends up broadcasting. Uh, there are some limitations. We can only play this trick in specific places. Now, in order to do this, we have to be able to create colliding messages under curl P27. What does that mean? That means that different messages with different trits um, end up hashing to the same thing under curl P27. I'm not going to tell you exactly how we do that in this talk. I don't have time to go into it. But you are, um, can check out our code base um, on GitHub. Uh, which has code that, that does this for um, example bundles. And here I have a screen capture um, where we're running this tool. And so what's happening here is um, I'm running this on an 80 core machine. And um, it's, uh, it's running through trying to find collisions in curl P27. It has to find two um, in order to create colliding bundles. It already found one. Um, now it's going to find the second one. And as you can see here, it's, this is taking on the order of seconds. It's not supposed to take seconds to find collisions and hash functions. Um, OK, it finds uh, collisions. It has to kind of set some different, uh, different pieces of state in different ways, which I, I didn't explain because I, I didn't talk about the, the hash function. And then I run it through this um, validate tool. And when you run it through the validate tool, you see, yes, these um, hash to the same thing. They pay different amounts to different people. Um, and they, uh, they both validate in terms of signatures. Um, so this took like tens of seconds on an 80 core machine. On a laptop, it would probably be on the order of minutes. So what happened? Um, well, I would have fixed our signature vulnerability. We, we told them about it in July of 2017. And in response, they replaced their hash function, curl p27. And uh, I didn't explain this, but curl is the name of the hash function. p stands for prototype, according to the IOTA developers. And 27 is the number of rounds that are used. Um, they also use curl p with 81 rounds um, in IOTA for other functions. Um, so what happened was they replaced many uses of curl p27, but not all of them. And they still use uh, curl p81 in a couple places as well. Um, in IOTA, as it is currently deployed, a bundle also has to be approved by an entity called the coordinator in order to be accepted. Um, the coordinator is a trusted party that is run by the IOTA developers that approves and checkpoints the state of the tangle by signing it. Uh, the source code for the coordinator is not publicly available. Um, since we didn't interact with the IOTA network whatsoever, we can't really confirm how the how the um, coordinator would impact our proposed attacks. But we are not aware of any mechanism in the coordinator that would prevent the attacks. And we didn't really look into the fact that curl p27 is still being used in IOTA for the coordinator. So um, that's still an open question. Um, IOTA claims that this was actually intentional and that this was a back door. Um, so reading this quote, curl p was indeed deployed in the open source IOTA protocol code as a copy protection mechanism to prevent bad actors from cloning the protocol and using it for nefarious purposes. So when um, my colleague Ethan asked the IOTA developer who said this, did we discover a copy protection backdoor in IOTA, they said the answer to the first question is, of course, yes, as we have explained above. Oh. <coughs> um, so. Uh, IOTA did replace curl p27 for signing uh, bundles with uh, what they now call curl with a k, which is based on SHA-3, um, which is uh, a, a more well-known hash function. Uh, however, part of the reason that they had written their own hash function in the first place was because they were trying to design something that was optimized for 
ternary hardware, which SHA-3 is not. Uh, so they actually commissioned um, a security company to create a new hash function for them um, that is designed for ternary hardware. Um, so this happened in 2018. We haven't looked at this at all, but I wanted to sort of in the interest of um, get, telling you all the information, they have a new hash function. Um, it's called Troika. It was designed by a uh, cryptography consulting company out of Europe called CyberCrypt. And um, there is currently a 200,000 euro prize pool to break round reduced variants of Troika. So um, this is good. They're, they put it out there for the community to try to break. Um, now, an obvious question is, why ternary? Um, so uh, the IOT developers wrote a post um, a little while back that says, currently, IOTA uses the relatively hardware-intensive NIST standard, SHA-3, Ketchak, for crucial operations for maximal security. We started tackling the hardware side with new thinking and computational processing, a next-generation microprocessor architecture based on ternary logic for ultimate efficiency in IoT as a result. A deep-dive blog post on trinary superiority over binary will come soon. I've not seen this yet. Um, but watch their blog to find out about trinary superiority over binary. <coughs> okay, so that was um, an experience that I went through with a, uh, with a disclosure of a vulnerability. Um, and it was a little bit strange. Um, and I think we learned a lot from that particular disclosure and also a few other disclosures um, that people who work for the DCI were also involved in. And so I wanted to share the lessons that we learned from what we went through. So lessons learned for disclosures. Expect wildly different types of responses from the people that you disclose to. Um, and in fact, be prepared to obtain legal representation. So we actually, shout out to Boston University's um, Technology Law Clinic who represented us for free because, um, because we had students who were working on this. Um, but we actually, ended up like doing quite a bit of work with them. They helped us out quite a bit. Um, and we were really happy to have them looking over what we wrote to make sure that it was okay from a legal standpoint. Um, it worries me that not everyone has access to free legal help like that. So um, it's, a, it's a little bit worrisome. And because of that, I would suggest that people who are gonna disclose a vulnerability consider doing so anonymously. Um, I think, you know, these coins can suck up a lot of your time. Um, and you never know what the response is gonna be and you never know what's gonna happen um, on crypto Twitter or with the people who are holding the coin. So um, I think if, if I were to go through this experience again, I would definitely consider doing it anonymously. Um, and set timeline and expectations from the beginning. I've talked to numerous people who've disclosed bugs who um, got caught in a sort of limbo where they weren't sure if they could talk about it yet, but they hadn't really fixed it and so they were kind of stuck. So I think it's really important to um, set a timeline and expectations from the beginning. Google Project Zero is really great about this. So you can just basically copy everything that they do. Um, lessons learned for cryptocurrencies. So have a responsible disclosure policy. It's surprising the number of cryptocurrencies that don't do this. This includes a, like a contact address, GPG keys, um, another experience that the DCI went through was um, when a, uh, a developer at the DCI, Corey Fields, disclosed a bug to a Bitcoin Cash implementation called Bitcoin ABC. Uh, he wrote a post about it, and you can read it here on Medium. It's on the DCI Medium. Um, he disclosed a vulnerability in April of 2018, and he wrote this post in August about his experience, and he was expressing a lot of frustration. At the time when he disclosed, Bitcoin ABC didn't have a disclosure policy. He found it difficult to find the contact information for the developers. He found it really difficult to contact them anonymously. Um, and he found it hard to confirm receipt when he had sort of put something out there. Uh, I'm happy to say that all of this has since been fixed, which is great. Um, but it is worrisome that what was at the time the second largest cryptocurrency had a lot of these problems. Um, this brings me to the next lesson, which is to support anonymous communication. There are actually many other reasons to uh, disclose anonymously besides the fact that you might not want to get attacked on Twitter. Um, these cryptocurrencies are worth a lot of money. 
there's many billions of dollars behind these things, and disclosing a vulnerability might cause the price to move. Um, there's a potential for whoever knows about it to actually exploit it and make a lot of money, and they can do so in a way where you know, it's a lot easier than in the existing financial system to stay anonymous and get away with it. You can also cause people to lose a lot of money. And if a vulnerability is exploited, even if you didn't do it, if there's proof or you know, there's like a message that says that you knew about it, you immediately become a suspect um, and a target. So I think it's important to think really adversarially when you're going through this process. There's a lot of money involved here, and you never know what people are going to do. Um, and because an attacker could gain so much financially by exploiting one of these vulnerabilities, I think it's really important that cryptocurrencies should consider commensurate bounties. Um, there's a few cryptocurrencies out there that have bounties, uh, but most of them don't. And that means that the incentives are not really aligned for uh, someone who finds something to disclose instead of deploying. Uh, but let me just say, don't do your bounty in your own coin, OK? Um, I know this is very tempting <laughs> because you control your own coin, but um, you know, people don't want to deal with that. And uh, it, the incentives around there are really messed up if the value of the coin goes up or down based on the disclosure. So do not price bounties in your own coin. Um, also, I think cryptocurrency should forge relationships with researchers and the developers of related implementations. Try to treat other cryptocurrencies the way that you would like to be treated so that they responsibly disclose to you instead of attacking you. Um, unfortunately, the people that you might be competing with who forked off of your code base probably also have the developers who are working most closely with your code base, and so they're well positioned to find bugs in the code. Um, so this is kind of an unfortunate tension that oftentimes people don't get along, so they fork the code to work on different cryptocurrencies, and they should, I think, stay in touch with each other and maintain a good relationship because those are the people who are going to find the bugs in the code. We saw this happen, actually, um, after Corey disclosed the bug in Bitcoin ABC. Um, I think that his disclosure actually built goodwill um, because right after that, the next vulnerability in Bitcoin Core, and Corey is a Bitcoin Core developer, was disclosed by a Bitcoin Cash developer. Um, his Reddit handle is um, he had He also has a Medium post about this. And I don't know if you can read this, but what's on the, on the left right there are some of the comments on Corey's post. Um, there are comments from like pretty hardcore Bitcoin Cash supporters thanking him for what he did, and um, it was it was really nice actually. Um, and Ameni, when he also wrote his post about his disclosure experience, talked about he mentioned Corey like several times in that post. Um, okay, so those are some lessons that uh, that I think you know we've been able to derive from the experiences that we've been through so far, but unfortunately. I think, I think that there are many, many challenging open questions that remain in how to do this effectively and how to make sure that our cryptocurrencies are secure. So first of all, big question is who do you tell? Knowledge is power. So first of all, sometimes it's just hard to figure out who to tell. There are a lot of zombie coins out there, actually. Um, but second of all, developers might actually exploit their own users. A lot of these people are not necessarily very trustworthy, despite the fact that they are the software developers behind a cryptocurrency implementation. And knowledge is power. But also, in an ideal world, there aren't supposed to be privileged parties to disclose to, right? I mean, that's what we've been talking about these two days, about decentralization and how great it is and how you know there's no trusted third party. Isn't that amazing? Except we kind of really need it. Like, it's totally impractical to actually put a vulnerability out there to everyone at the same time. A lot of people are going to lose a lot of money. And like, I don't care how sort of technically savvy you are, what if you're not looking at your computer that day that a vulnerability gets dropped and you don't have time to update? The fact of the matter is that there is an inherent tension between so-called decentralization and protecting users and we have to disclose vulnerabilities responsibly and to only a few people at a time. I think this is just a fact of life. 
this is really, um, it's, it's just really untenable to think about everybody finding out at the same time and having to update themselves. Um, and this is very different than the corporate security world. In the corporate security world, there's a lot of professionality, there's a lot of professionalism, you know? Um, Google finds a bug in a browser, and they, or in Intel, and they can go and tell Intel about it, and you know, it's all very nice, they all, they have channels. Um, this does not totally exist in the cryptocurrency world yet. There are some informal channels, but um, it's really challenging to figure out who to tell and when. How do you inform everyone else? So let's say you're a cryptocurrency developer and you find out about a vulnerability in your coin or your system. Uh, how are you supposed to communicate this to and, and, and get the mitigation, get the fix out in your ecosystem? So remember, developers might exploit their own users. So you have to be careful about who you tell and when, uh, in particular telling adjacent related um, coins. Um, you know, you might not necessarily trust some sketchy exchange based out of the Caribbean. Uh, you might not trust them not to exploit their users. So you have to think really carefully about who you're gonna tell. There are really no easy answers with coordinated disclosure. Anyone who knows about a vulnerability might exploit it. That is sort of the mindset you have to have going into this. So, um, you know, different cryptocurrencies have done this in different ways. I, I don't think that there is a a one-size-fits-all kind of a plan for how to do this. Um, I think every developer team needs to kind of think about this really carefully and think about what their process is and probably share with their users and their ecosystem um, because sometimes this doesn't go super great. Uh, for example, um, the denial of service vulnerability that was disclosed by Omeni um, he uh, disclosed a Bitcoin Core, uh, Bitcoin Cash, and Bitcoin Unlimited simultaneously. This kicked off a ticking clock for the Bitcoin Core developers. Um, they had to presume that one of the other cryptocurrency developers might exploit this vulnerability in Bitcoin. And so they had to get their fix out as fast as possible. However, users are lazy, even exchanges and um, wallets and people running nodes. So how do you convince them to take this seriously and upgrade, especially when you can't tell them about it until the fix is deployed? So the Bitcoin Core developers hid a fix for the inflation bug inside of the fix for the denial of service bug. And then they told everyone about the denial of service bug. They told everyone about the denial of service bug in order to get them to upgrade as fast as possible. So they made this decision that it was better to publicly, to go public with one bug in order to prevent a worse one from being exploited. This effectively dropped a zero day on many coins derived from Bitcoin Core. Um, another really important question, should you move vulnerable funds? Um, I think this is a really challenging question. I don't know the answer. Is it illegal or unethical to move people's money because they, the money is locked inside a contract or a transaction that's vulnerable? Should you protect them from it by moving it? Or is it illegal and unethical not to move their money if you know that um, it's vulnerable to a particular bug and you can move it? Maybe you should uh, to protect them from it. The IOTA developers actually did this to their own users. In October of 2017, some IOTA tokens were, quote, found to be at risk of theft due to users reusing their private keys. So the IOTA team temporarily took the vulnerable funds into custody um, and set up a process for users to come back to them to get their funds back. Really important question. How do we get more people to look at this stuff? Uh, the inflation bug was in Bitcoin for 18 months. It's a really long time. And the Bitcoin developers are not slacking. Like, they're working really, really hard. This is just life. Sometimes these things get by. I mean, every cryptocurrency probably has some horrible bug in it right now. The, uh, the flaw in Zcash actually originated in the paper, um, the BCTV14 paper, that Zcash was based on, the proof system in Zcash was based on. This bug persisted for years, even after multiple papers and code audits commissioned by the Zcash uh, company. What ended up happening with that was really interesting. 
um, Zcash contracted Ariel Gabzon to uh, write a proof um, for the proof system. There was one proof that was kind of sort of like talked about a little bit, but it hadn't actually been done. And in the act of, of writing this proof, he discovered the flaw, um, which is really amazing. So this is the original paper, BCTV17. Um, and my office mate is actually one of the authors on this paper, Madars, Madars Virza. And he tweeted about how, um, you know, he was writing his dissertation and he didn't even, he didn't notice the bug even when he was writing his dissertation and like going back over all of this in the proof system, right? Um, it's not his fault. A lot of people didn't notice. But, you know, I like to the, entertain the idea that Madars is an evil mastermind um, who planted this on purpose. So either the authors of BCTV14 are these evil geniuses who purposefully put this flaw in their zero knowledge proof system um, and then patiently waited until it was deployed in a cryptocurrency uh, and then took advantage of it and created lots of shielded transactions, uh, shielded money in, the, uh, money in the shielded transaction pool in Zcash. Um, or security is just really hard. And the problem is these two things are completely indistinguishable to us. We have no way of knowing which one is true. We have no way of knowing whether or not this bug was exploited in Zcash. And to be clear, this has nothing to do with trusted setup. So great talk by David on trusted setup. This has nothing to do with trusted setup. This could happen even in a system that did not use trusted setup. This is about a flaw in the underlying design and a flaw in the code. So it is true that security is really, really hard. Um, so one thing that we've decided to do is we've started a cryptocurrency security working group. We're doing a lot of things that um, are, that honestly, the community, the ecosystem should have been doing all along, like identifying and circulating best practices, making sure everybody has um, an email address, GPG keys, also writing more tests, running more monitoring, um, writing security tools, and uh, eventually, we hope, supporting research on safer programming languages and formal verification. Um, we've got a really awesome group together with people from CrowdStrike, uh, Arwin, Bitcoin Core, Gemini, Coinbase, Facebook Circle, um, a lot of people, we're talking to a lot of security engineers in a lot of different places. Um, and we have an idea that Corey mentioned yesterday in the panel on responsible disclosure, where um, we want to start a convention of doing disclosure.md, which is in your cryptocurrency repository on GitHub or wherever, you actually have this file, the special file, so people know how to contact you, they know what your um, policies are, um, and they, uh, they can contact you anonymously. So I think, you know, this conference, the theme of this conference is the next 10 years. I think in order for us to really be around for the next 10 years, we have to figure out how to take security seriously. Um, and we have to figure out how to compensate developers fairly to do this work. Um, we shouldn't, as users of this technology, we should not put up with half-baked architectures or untested cryptography. We should demand better. We should stop putting money behind all of the crap that is out there. I know it looks like fun and it's like gambling, but every time you give money to that, um, you know, you're supporting bad practices. Um, so the next 10 years, cryptocurrency and blockchain technology is on the world stage. And I think um, in order, you know, we need to step up. We have to, we have to step up and really grow up um, and put in place some serious processes so that we can implement this technology safely. Um, that's all I have. If you're interested in any of this at all, please contact us, the security working group. Um, if you have ideas on how to do disclosure, uh, or if you're interested in the journal, um, send us a note. Thank you. Thinking about um, CryptoNote or other zombie projects on, on GitHub and where there are vulnerabilities within them, what, what role do you think uh, GitHub or other centralized entities have that are hosting those projects where vulnerabilities exist 
What, what responsibility do they have to uh, mitigate those? Uh, I, I don't think GitHub has any responsibility to mitigate those. Um, I think that they're providing a service. And I think it's, it's uh, probably the responsibility of the users of that code to be responsible for the code that they're importing and using and to um, you know, put the monetary resources n that are necessary in to make sure it's secure and safe. Um, I will say we are talking to GitHub about this disclosure.md thing. So we reached out to them. And I know they want to help in this area. Yeah. It turns on eventually. OK. Um, I was wondering, so a lot of the, um, the bugs that you talked about were like implementation bugs. But for, I think, the Zcash in particular, that's like special because it, it was like so subtle. And it's part of the fact that the like, zero knowledge proof protocol is so new and like has not reached maturity, been reviewed by enough people. So I was curious what your thoughts are with regards to all of this like extremely new cryptographic research. Is it like should we just hold off on putting that in any coin for the next like you know X years or you know what is a good practice with regards to that that's like actually so subtle and so many people you know how to do their proper review? Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable launching something where I asked users to put in money behind untested cryptography. Um, I think that this is a choice that a lot of different people make, and, and obviously people are going to make a different choice than me, and that's totally fine. Um, but I think you know, what I can do, and I think what we all should do, is make users try to make users as aware as possible of what the risks are. I think so many people look at these things and say, oh, they've got like, all these like, professors and PhDs from MIT and Berkeley, and oh, they're so smart, and they figured out all this stuff. And it's like, that's just done. It's great. It's solid. And it's like, no. And, um, and, and so, like I said, personally, I think it's irresponsible to, to put billions of dollars behind untested cryptography. I appreciate the fact that there's you know trillions of dollars built no billions of dollars behind these coins, and that makes it a little different. But this is nothing more than the standard software test problem. Um, I mean, the model that the, the last company I worked at was for each line of code, you know, for literally every minute you wrote code, there was 12 minutes of all the other crap in order to actually try and write code that wasn't buggy. Is this any different? Yeah, so I've, I've asked myself that question a lot, actually. And um, I'm working with a set of uh, researchers from um, a workshop called Dogstool on a paper, a position paper, on why it is different, actually. And I think um, there's a few different things that make it different than the traditional security world. So first of all, I think that bugs in this space are uniquely, anonymously, um, and easily monetizable in a way that bugs in, in other systems aren't. Like, if you find a bug in Linux, I'm sure you can find a way to make some money off of it. Maybe you can short some companies or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, if you find this bug in Zcash or this bug in Bitcoin Cash or this bu bug in Bitcoin, I think you could have made money. And in particular, this cryptocurrency, the cryptocurrency ecosystem doesn't have the controls on it that the existing financial system does. So I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you could have figured out how to get away with it. But, but then I don't see how you ever release code. I mean, because you're going to constantly be in a state of fear of, I, I can't possibly put this code out there because it might have a bug in it that I just can't find. So you're, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. I don't know how you solve this problem. I think you, I think you, you, you take this really, really seriously. And that's kind of what I was hoping to get across in the talk today. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah. So, um, coming back to a point I made in my in, in my talk this morning, um, the uh, cryptographic assumptions are shaky. So the uh, Zcash protocol had a bug in the proof, but proofs in cryptography are not proofs of truth. The proof, um, the, uh, the 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 proof, even if it had been true about the. Uh, the setup protocol for the SNARKs in that uh, 2014 paper was a proof that everything works, everything's safe, if um, pairing-based uh, 
pairing-based crypto as a certain um, family of, um, of elliptic curve-based um, crypto systems, not the ones used for ECC digital signatures, but others, um, are hard to, that the mathematical problem there is hard to break. Nobody knows that. What counts in the cryptographic community, the pure crypto community, is proving that my clever new system is no harder to break than this mathematical assumption. We don't know that to be true um, in the way that we know how to replace a battery in a, in a mic. Stuart, do, do you have a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hi. So let's say a hack has inevitably happened. Is it unethical, illegal, or I don't know, for engineers to exercise their power to revert the effects of such hacks, such as we saw with Ethereum DAO, or with possible discussions on the reversion of the party multisig funds? Uh, I don't. I don't have anything to say about that. Sorry. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if bugs are so much uh, higher stake in cryptocurrencies than in the rest of the world, should we, use it, should we be using tools such as formal verification that uh, uh, help having much fewer bugs or, or tools such as techniques such as a heavy review of code like in the, at NASA or whatever? Or I think it would be great the more of those tools that we used and the more that became um, standard practice. I think that'd be wonderful. So um, I think part of what I was hoping to do was to encourage people to look into these things and to start using these tools. Um, I don't think formal verification is a panacea. Uh, based on my understanding of where it is right now, um, it, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to promise you your code doesn't have any bugs in it. I've seen research systems that were formally verified that ended up having bugs. So, um, you know, just sprinkling some formal verification on things isn't going to isn't going to get you out of um, this tangle, I think. So, but it would be great to use more of those tools. Okay. Thank you.